Hello, welcome to another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at the Blue Note here in New York City. Blessing the stage tonight and this week is saxophonist, guitarist, and vocalist Curtis Steigers. And his latest Concord Records release, Let's Go Out Tonight, he's departed from the last five projects and he dived into covering material of the great folk, blues, as well as soul classics. And then he's recording songs and covers by artists ranging from Bob Dylan to Eddie Floyd to Jeff Tweedy to Nick Lowe. We sat down earlier and we talked about the concept of this new record. We also talked about his origins growing up in Boise, Idaho, and him encountering his mentor, the late pianist, Mr. Gene Harris. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the sounds of Mr. Curtis Steigers live here at the Blue Note here in New York City. Welcome back to your old stomping grounds, New York City, and congratulations on your latest album, Let's Go Out Tonight. And, you know, I, I told the viewers earlier, setting up the piece, that you really took a departure from the jazz standards, and you're going into the more American roots music, folk, rock, and soul music on this. Yeah, we... Um, I I made this record with Larry Klein, a great uh, uh, producer who comes originally from the jazz world. I mean, he was a, a, a well-known uh, jazz bassist, uh, played with Wayne Shorter, and uh, um, you know, even played uh, on the Merv Griffin show. He took Ray Brown's place on the Merv Griffin show. But he got into playing, uh, you know, producing singer-songwriters, especially when he married Joni Mitchell. That'll that'll kind of do that to you, marrying Joni Mitchell. And uh, I found that when we got together, we we had a lot of the same taste. Not only we were, were we great fans of jazz and, and, and students of jazz, but we also love singer-songwriters and we love good country music and good soul music and, and, and you know, some of the best pop music. And so we started just playing songs for each other and they ended up, rather than being, you know, standards, rather than being the great American songbook that everyone sort of knows, they were songs by Steve Earle and songs by uh, Neil Finn from Crowded House and Split Ends and, and so, uh, a song by uh, um, Paul Buchanan from a great Scottish band called The Blue Nile. M songs that aren't necessarily associated with with, with uh, jazz music, uh, but you can you can do a lot of uh, different things with a great song. You don't it doesn't have to be um, doesn't have to just come from the same place. The other thing is that I stopped worrying about whether or not anyone 
cared whether or thought it was jazz. I just decided to make a record that was beautiful, that had beautiful music that was real, emotional, and and honest. And so there are a lot of, I mean, a lot of this record is jazz, but there are elements of all those other things, folk music, pop music, soul, blues. You know, another thing, too, you know, a lot of... Uh Jazz vocalists are kind of breaking away from that. Kurt Elling is doing that now, and and Cassandra Wilson has done a fantastic job as taking some American folk music and making it jazz standards. How have you been able to fluctuate both? Because you know there are people, there's some jazz Nazis out there. They're like, no, no, you can't do this. But there are some people that are really, really receptive to this. This is a great concept album. Well, yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean. Uh Kurt Elling is, is now digging into that. Cassandra Wilson was a real pioneer of, of, of finding, you know, songs that were not from the, the, the standard uh, book. Um, you know, even Diana Krall, you know, has, has, has started digging, digging into that sort of stuff. Miles Davis did it, you know. Uh, uh, Dizzy Gillespie did it. Uh, you know, Sarah Vaughn did it. They took songs that weren't jazz tunes, pop tunes and Broadway tunes, and they turned them into jazz tunes i mean that's how it always was the the thing that broke that i think was when rock and roll happened and it kind of killed the commercial side of jazz there was a chip on the shoulder of jazz music and jazz musicians about pop music and rock music it's like oh that's not music that that's something else it took a long time for that that animosity between the jazz world and and modern pop music and rock and roll to go away now singers are realizing oh my gosh there's this there's this 50 year heritage of fantastic great songs and it's it's the the, the extension of the great american songbook and there's english songwriters and scottish songwriters and irish songwriters as well so um it, it it makes sense to me. It, it has always made sense to me that you'd you'd sing a song by Elvis Costello right next to a song by Cole Porter or a, or a, or a, you know a Merle Haggard tune next to a to a song by uh, the Gershwins or uh, somebody like that. It it makes sense. They're pop songs. comfortable doing do you prefer, prefer singing or do you prefer blowing because I've seen you perform before and you can blow you can blow that saxophone well I'm definitely a singer uh, first I mean I, I grew up playing uh, clarinet and then saxophone I've been a, I've been a horn player longer than I've been a singer 
But uh, there was a certain point, and frankly, it had a lot to do with one of my you know, my main mentor, Gene Harris, the great jazz pianist, who, whose uh, jam sessions I used to go to as a kid in, in of all places, my hometown, Boise, Idaho. He, it, that's where Gene retired to. There's, you know, one of the legends of jazz piano retired to Boise, Idaho, and he had a jam session every Tuesday night. And I'd go in and I'd play, and, and he was very supportive and, and to, to several of my friends and I. And there was a certain point where he, I think, you know, he, he heard me sing, and he, he said, you know, you're, you're a good saxophone player, but you're, I think the singing thing is something you ought to, to, to go towards. So, you know, I still play sax. Um, I never became the horn player that I wanted to be. I never became, uh, you know, Hank Mobley. I, you know, I, 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 I dream of being that. I'm more of a rhythm and blues saxophone player than I'm a jazz singer. And that's, that's fine. I, I've got a sound. It's, it's, it's what, I, what I do. But I'm a singer. I, you know, I joke, you know, especially when there's a, a great saxophone player in the room. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a singer who owns a sax. <laughs> <laughs> I told you earlier, you know, I, I go back to you from your very beginnings. You were the darling of VH1, and <laughs> you were the darling of Arista Records. I mean, you came out as a pop artist, and you came to New York City after you graduated to become a jazz vocalist, and you ended up becoming a pop vocalist. And how did you segue back into your roots of jazz? Well, I always did everything. I mean, I'm not everything, but I, I always had the, the the opportunity to play pop music and rock music and soul and ska and, and jazz too. I grew up, you know, studying jazz in school, but after school I'd go home and play my drums and play in punk rock bands and, and eventually was a saxophone player in a soul band. When I moved to New York, um, I found that because um, there were so many great jazz saxophonists in town that I wasn't really going to go to a, a jazz club and, and, and try to sit in with, with all these hot shots because, I, again, I'm a rhythm and blues saxophonist. And there weren't too many places for jazz singers, I mean, really no places for a jazz singer to go. I mean, jazz singers tend to be the red-headed stepchild of the, uh, <laughs> of the jazz world. So I went in through the blues clubs. I played saxophone and then started singing and... and I started writing songs then, and the songs weren't jazz. They were they were pop tunes. They were soul tunes. I mean, I was trying to write songs like Al Green or or you know more modern uh, sort of pop soul singers like uh, I mean Bonnie Raitt or or, or John Hyatt uh, and people like that. Um, I got a record deal with Arista Records, and Clive Davis, the president of the record company, wanted me to make a, a pop record, and uh, it was fun. It was great. 
as soon as I was done with that, I wanted to make a jazz record, and I wanted to make a singer-songwriter record, and I wanted to do all the different things that I'd always done, and I found that the pop world didn't want me to do that. They didn't want, he in particular, this, this uh, record company president, wanted me to do the same thing over and over again, and I get bored really quickly. So, so I found that I had to kind of dismantle that, that pop career in order to really find my way back to what I wanted to do. Um, and it helped, uh, it helped that I knew Gene Harris, the, the jazz pianist, and he was on Concord Records. And uh, um, after, it was a little while after he passed uh, um, that, I, uh, that I took a, rec a, a group of uh, recordings uh, uh, that became my first record on Concord Records to my friend uh, John Burke, who had been uh, at Concord Records, who had been Gene Harris's A&R guy. And uh, it just made sense. It was a strange circle, you know, where I started playing at jam sessions with Gene Harris when I was 14 years old, and there I ended up, you know, back at his, his at his label even after he was gone, and I'm still with Concord Records. It's a, it's pretty funny how uh, how the earliest roots will uh, will will stick with you. Where the cars go by. Did you in a, ever in a million years believe that the FX television show Sons of Anarchy would be the hit that it is? Because when I heard the theme song, I was like, wow, this is Curtis Stivers. <laughs> and and then, you know, it took about a season before the traction, you know, it, it, that, yeah. for, that initial season takes a while. And sure. then the second season kind of kapow. It, it keeps growing, that show. Uh, it... Uh... I, I got involved because Bob Thiel Jr., the uh, the music supervisor of the show, is an old friend of mine. We've been writing songs together for, for over a decade. And his father, of course, is the Bob Thiel Sr., the, 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 the great jazz producer. He produced all those Impulse, uh, John Coltrane records. I mean, he was he's just was a huge figure in jazz music. And I mean, he even, he even co-wrote uh, What a Wonderful World, uh, the Louis Armstrong tune. Uh, uh, Bob called me, or actually he emailed me and said, I got this show that I'm doing the, the music for. We need some lyrics to this. This is what the show's about. You know, it's like violent bikers and, you know, just like me, really macho and scary. <laughs> and I, I wrote it and I ended up singing it. You know, I actually sang it in Boise at home in Boise, Idaho, and then, you know, emailed the, the recording. The next thing you know, it's on TV. And then a year later, we got nominated for an Emmy, and then the year after that, it's the hottest show on TV. I mean, this thing is huge, so it's been a lot of fun. It's 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 a chance for me to kind of to to flex my bluesier, more rock and roll muscles. Every now and then, I'll do another song for the show, and it, it's it definitely is out of my my jazz. Uh, uh, I don't know where people sort of know me these days, but uh, you know I I like to rock and and uh, it's a, we just did a show on the set we did a little uh, live thing on the set of the show and it was uh, it was pretty funny I grew out my facial hair just for that it wasn't for you it was for that. Seen a light of fire. Seen water turned to wine. I've seen healing hands walking on water. Something to believe in And I thought I'd seen it all But I never 
What does jazz music mean to you? Oof, wow, that is a tough question. Jazz means a lot of things. I mean, you know, jazz has, you know, j people call a lot of different kinds of music jazz. For me, the, the I, mean, I can't really say what it means to me, but I can, I can say that the things I like most about it are the spontaneity and the, the improvisation and the openness. Uh, one of the problems with the jazz business or the jazz world is the closed-mindedness of it. There are so many jazz, there, there are fewer and fewer, but there are a lot of jazz fans and a lot of people who say book jazz festivals that have this narrow vision of what it is. And when I meet somebody who is in a position of power or a position where they can, they can create music, live music, recordings, who has an open vision of what it is. Well, jazz is that, but it's also that. And, and does it really matter what, what's jazz and what's maybe a little, you know, partly not jazz? That's when I'm impressed with somebody. I, I once had a conversation with Matt Wilson, one of the best jazz uh, drummers in the world, and we were getting ready to make a record, and he suggested a certain musician, a guy called Dave Tronzo, to play electric slide guitar on the record and I love Dave Tronzo's playing but I'd always known him as something other than jazz and I said well that's brilliant but is it jazz and Matt Wilson said what's jazz <laughs> and that was the best question I mean it was a question answering a question but what does it matter it's it's the, there's there's so much of it out there in in, in, a, in a wide range let it let it let it fall let it rise on its own merit. If it's good music, if it's spontaneous, if it's improvised, if it's beautiful, if it's if it's sad, if it's dark, you know, let it be. And you know, the the good stuff will rise to the top, and the bad stuff will hopefully go away. That'll do it again for another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace Report, live here at the Blue Note here in New York City. I'd like to personally thank Mr. Curtis Steigers for his time, as well as the staff and management here at the Blue Note. It's always please visit my website, www.thepacereport.com, for my weekly column as well as my past segments. Until next time, remember, if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Until next time, peace. The worried man with the worried mind. No one in front of me and nothing behind me. There's a woman on my lap. She's drinking champagne. Assassin's eyes. I'm looking up into the sapphire to the sky.